and the fish we are after is the mighty spring salmon, often known as a Chinook, Tai, King, or Quitnat. For the fishing location, our party has chosen to go to Pender Harbor, one of the beauty spots of the British Columbia coastline, 50 miles north of the city of Vancouver, and just north of the 49th parallel. A body of water has to be crossed by ferry, the water system known as Howe Sound. This water trip, taking 45 minutes, takes you among most beautiful islands linking the mainland at a docking area known as Langdale. From here, you drive up the scenic peninsula to Pender Harbor, a 50-mile trip. Our party consists of two ladies who have never been salmon fishing before. Instructor George Nash will no doubt have his hands full teaching Diane Hurd and Kay Perkins the correct procedure in connecting with Mr. Spring Salmon. Boats and live bait are readily available in the area, which is frequented by fishermen from all parts of the globe. Now let's join George for a little instruction. Peter Benjafield, one of the fishing outfitters of Pender Harbor, will ensure that fresh live bait is available. Okay, girls, uh, while we're waiting for Peter, we might as well uh, I'll tie up some of this gear. I'll uh, show you what we need in the way of tackle to uh, for these springs. We'll get a hold of some uh, leader material here. Oh, I guess the first thing we should do is put the rod together. Okay, I'll keep this through, girls. I'll put the rod back okay. up there. You can hang on to it, too, yeah. if you will. It's very uh, flexible, isn't it? It's a very, very soft tip rod. You need a soft tip rod for this type of fishing. Uh, what? Well, for springs, mainly, and cohos. Uh -huh. We've got to use uh, an ounce of lead on here, and uh, the rod is made to take that type of in? lead. Oh. the end of it. Can you get it? <laughs> get it. No. I'm getting her now. She's getting away from me. Uh, we'll let a little slack off here. What goes on there? I'll put this here. Well, we'll put the lid on first. I'll show you how to put this knot in on here. Just take the line and put it through. It's a simple matter of twisting it about six times. On there like that. And we put it through the other eye here. Through the loop you made with the That's right, eye. through the loop mm -hmm. I made with the nylon line, and then back through again. And you just take it in your teeth and pull it nice and snug. Is there a special name for that knot? Well, there is a special name for it right now. It's a sort of a slip knot deal. Mm -hmm. Bites right in there. There we are. I guess that gets tighter, it's more stressful. Well, no, it doesn't? won't get any tighter. There's lots of give in the nylon. Well, here we'll take the, the hooks, and these hooks are very small. We're using number eights, in this case here, for these live herring. We don't want the fish to feel too big a hook when they take it. Now, the bottom one goes on, and it's just a matter of making a loop, pulling it through. Now, this is a little difficult, maybe, but you get used to it. And we go around approximately a half a dozen times like that. <laughs> that looks hard. <laughs> well, it looks hard. It's not too hard when you get the knack of it. And then we... Bite the end and pull it through. That's the bottom one on there. Now we're gonna put the second one on. We've slipped it over there. Now we'll just take a few turns, very the same similar mm -hmm. movements around that you make uh, as you made around the first one. Do you always use two hooks for Well, coho you don't necessarily need two hooks for coho fishing. Uh, it depends on the size of herring that you have or that are available. Okay. In our case here, why, it'll probably be around four to five inches. Well, we'll try and catch one of these little fellas here now, so we can bait him up. Mm. They're little, little things, aren't they? Look yeah, at your cuff. my shirt sleeve in there. Not so many of the buckets. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Okay. That's what you call fishing by That's hand. That's fishing by hand. Is right. Now, you put the first, the top hook, right through these two little vent holes, more or less like a nasal passage there, above the mouth. The uh, other one, we put right through the adipose fin in the bottom. Now, some fellas put it through the dorsal fin at the top. Either way is very effective. Now, the reason we put it through the nasal passage here is the simple mm -hmm. fact that the fish will drown if you put it through the lips, like some people do do. Now, we'll oh, just I leave see. that little fellow like that, and we'll put him over, and I think we're going to catch ourselves a nice big spring. Good. Just what I want. Do your work. I will do our work. 
lower her down in the water. Now you notice how he swims around like that right on top? Well, that's why we hook him that way, see? Now he's very, very lively when you're with a hook set up like that. And that little fellow will swim around on the end of that line all day like that, providing that some big spring or Chinook doesn't come along and swallow him, which we want. So let's hope somebody gets him. You mean he'll stay alive all day? He'll stay alive all day like that. Oh, that's fine. Well, so much for instruction in tying the lines. Let's hit for the fishing grounds. Mr. Spring Salmon, with his many nicknames, is usually found feeding in quiet, deep bays along the Pacific coast. Springs can be caught the year round in these waters, but frequent the bays in more abundant numbers in late spring prior to their migration for spawning in the coastal rivers. These same salmon could have been living in the sea as long as eight years, but the average migration back to the spawning grounds is usually after the fourth or fifth year. The average fish could be four feet in length, weighing 20 pounds, 10 to 50 pounds, even a 108 pounder was landed. Fixed up. And this is where we're going to catch our tie, that's for sure. This old line out here, if you just hold off for a minute till I get this hook out. We'll get our lines twisted up now. There she goes, she's going down now. We made it. That's just dandy. Good. Just enough line. That's swell. Now we'll get down to the business of fishing. You all ready, uh, Danny? Okay. All right, then. You just put that first hook right through the nasal passage now. Right, this no, one this here? no, this top okay. one here, yeah. Put right in there. Like that. Okay, now you can put the other one. You got to hold them. Don't squeeze them too hard now. You're liable to kill them. Three. Whoops, 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 whoops. whoops. <laughs> you got a hold of them? Yeah, I got all right. I'm scared to squeeze them too much. Sorry, right, you go ahead. Okay, now that's good. Right. Yeah, the line. Just caught in the barrel. Caught in the barrel. Ow, ow, ow. You can get the hook? Yeah. Just caught around there, is he? Okay, here we go. Okay, here you see. do it. <laughs> oh, all right. Just a minute, get that line out of the way there. Okay, he's in there now. Yeah, that's okay. That's it. All right, over he goes now. Where's the lead? There's the fish. Go. Okay. Okay. My 30 there she is. All right. Are you all right, Danny? You got bait on there? How many feet? All right. I'd go. I'd go down a good 60 feet here. Lots of water underneath it. That's swell. Now, oh, girls, will let these lines lay down to within 20 feet of the bottom. This is where most of the chinooks are hooked around here. We want to make sure we get right in line with them when they're coming along. You drop it down to the bottom and then... You can drop it down to the bottom and you can reel it up about 20 feet. That's just about all you need and we'll just sit there and we'll just wait for our friends to come along and start nibbling on that little herring and uh, then we'll be in business. Now don't forget, keep your fingers out of the way when you're pulling your line or reeling in because when he starts to run, you'll have to get your fingers banged on the knobs as they're going around because they really peel it off. Mm -hmm. Believe me, they really go. Let it go and start Just pulling. let it go. As long as he wants to go, keep the line tight let him go. Spring salmon are called taiyi after they exceed 30 pounds. In early spring, they gorge themselves with live herring prior to the returns to the rivers for spawning. This being the most natural feed for salmon in this area at this time of the year, our enthusiastic nimrods are going to use live herring as bait in an effort to lure one of the big ones on the end of a rod. As you will notice, it is most important to hook up the bait properly so it will appear as natural as possible. This is known as mooching. Just let them run. They get easy. They'll come back again. Try to swing your rod around to the front of the boat when he goes that way, so it'll make it easier for me to take him. Easy, baby. You always let him take all the line? Not necessarily. You hold him tight. That's all. Just hold him tight. Let him know the spot. There's your leads out of the water. Now this is the time to swing your rod a bit to see if I can't take him. Towards the front? Well, you're in a different position now. You can turn him, pull him towards the front. There you go on you again. Yeah. Okay, dear. There we go. Wow, oh, got it! Seven. 
You'll always find a number of boats fishing in one of the many bays in this area. You will also learn that up till now, no fishing license is required for fishing in salt water. In such surroundings, it is hard to resist wetting a line. Mr. Spring, unlike many of us are led to believe, does not swim through a school of herring with his mouth open to devour his food. He will usually dash through a school, thrashing his tail, stunning his quarry. He will then return and munch the herring to ensure they are dead, then spit them out and take them down head first so that their fins will not hook up in his throat. Looks like the instruction has paid off. The girls are into their second salmon already. Must be quite a thrill on their first trip out. Looks like their neighbors are doing equally as well. Of the five species of salmon that frequent our Pacific waters, the spring salmon has a reputation second to none for fine eating. They can be white fleshed, pink, or red, all equally good as salmon steaks or for baking. The girls did very well for the first trip out, but of course much of the credit is due to their very patient instructor, George Nash. So it's back to the city with two lovely salmon for the table. The girls will most likely now be looking for an instructor to show them how to prepare their fish. If my guess is correct, they'll end up as steaks. Fried salmon steak, anyone? Well, from salmon fishing to rainbow trout, this is a switch. The spring salmon is a good fighting game fish, but he cannot beat the acrobatic display put on by the rainbow. It's dry flies for lures this time. You can see the fish going already out here. So if you've never done any fly fishing before, if you can't catch them here, well, you'll never catch them anywhere. This time we have a young lady, Ruth McCready, who has never cast a dry fly rod before. Instructor Collie Peacock seems very calm about his task. Let's tag along and see how this is done. Well, here we are. This is the spot. This is where you're going to teach me? Yeah, I'm gonna rig you right up and show you how it goes, and then we'll you know, write what you're doing. And everything will work out all right. The area selected for our fishing trip is a lake known as Frogmore, elevation of 4,288 feet in the heart of the Kamloops Merritt area of British Columbia, Canada. Many such beautiful lakes are to be found in the interior of this province that are abundant with the rainbow trout. These fishes are America's contribution to the fishing world having been found in waters from California to Bristol Bay in Alaska and frequenting almost the entire Pacific watershed. Unlike other trout species of the char family who frequent the subarctic and arctic waters, the rainbow can adapt to the more temperate water temperatures and have been shipped to Australia and New Zealand, Chile, India, and South Africa. Basically insect feeders, they provide excellent wet or dry fly fishing. They will also take small shiny spin lures. They can weigh up to 20 pounds and 30 pounds, depending on the feed in the area. Some who have access to the sea and the wanderlust take to the salt water, returning to the fresh water streams to spawn and return to sea. Unlike the salmon, they do not die after spawning. Although they are the same rainbow trout, they are known as steelhead and frequent streams in spring and fall depending on their distance of migration. Like so, and then just put it back to its own eye. Now don't worry about the boat because uh, you see you're trying to counteract the roll. Don't ever try to calm, just let your knees bend with it and you won't, you won't as bad. Put a little of this line out. It's okay, won't get you. Might mush your hairdo up a little. How much do you put out? That's about all you can be able to throw for a little while. The thing to, you watch this line, the thing to visualize is 1 o'clock is there and 11 o'clock is there. And that's the way you throw it. 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Yeah? With your left hand or your right no, hand? No, you'll have to go the other way. I'm a gimpy handed type, so. Just pull back on this? Yeah, hold your hold this line stiff and I'll put this on here. Now watch. You just feel it in your hand. See that? Hmm. You just give it a little pause when it goes back. And then ahead. Just keep your arm stiff. Fairly stiff, yeah. A little bit of stiff arm and a little, quite a bit of wrist. And you just leave it sit there and wiggle it back and forth and we'll see what happens. Just 
Just go ahead. Just back? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. You had a hold of a lily pad out there. I don't think you saw it. No, I guess I didn't. But uh, you got worn a lily pad back here. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. That's just your first time. At the end of the day, you'll be going just it's like a million dollars. I'll just start this thing out for you again. There you are. No, can I? Oh. There we go. And then pull it back? No, just leave it sit right there. That's all you'll have to do now. Fish will come along and just pick that right off the top of the water. Move it, just wiggle it once in a while a little bit by yourself and then pick it up and put it out again sometime. Now? Mm-hmm, any time. Oh! Hey, gal, only thing is don't try and throw it with your arm. See, what you're trying to do is you're trying to throw it with your arm. Just make your wrist do it. See? Just like that. It's there, I think. Yeah, yeah it's there. And <coughs> don't pull it out of the water, eh? And dang on it. Yeah, well, let's, oh. not, let's not have my... Uh, I don't think he's too big anyway, so... But not bad for the first one, anyway. You've got to strike your fish just at the precise time when he rolls and takes that fly in his mouth. If not, he'll feel the hook and immediately spit it out. You've got to bed that hook just at the right time. A little bit more. A little bit more yet. Just so your leader doesn't come through the rod. And any time we want the fish, when he's finished playing, all you have to do is raise your rod up, you see? Just keep raising up? your yeah. You said don't. Yeah, but you've got, see, he's still too high in the air. It's just a small fish, so. It won't matter. Just keep raising your rod over. But you got a little too much line in there, see? Or too much rod. It's I too small, say. isn't it? Mm-hmm. No, no. We'll send him back and let him. See, there you. I'll show you how this works. That's about when you raise, you should more or less let the, the line slack up so the fish stays in the water but comes, skids toward the boat. Is that right? The problem with casting the rainbow is keeping him on the line once hooked. You must strike the fish at the precise time he takes the fly, then maintain pressure on the line during his fight to shake the hook. This will muster all the skill of an experienced angler if he happens to embed a barb into a large one. It also appears here that instruction is paid off. Many lakes have been stocked, but many still have large numbers of native fishes that maintain a large stock throughout the spawning in local creeks. You're all set. The, uh, see, don't let them uh, bring them in too short to do their fighting. See, out there he can't beat you. You've got the, you've got the uh, cushioning of the rod, Where's and you can at? steer them. You see. Otherwise, you've got a short line. You can't steer them around. You can keep them out. These fish are running a little bigger right where we are right now. It's all right, eh? Andy. One other little thing when you come in, just shake that net off, or else we'll be standing. You know, just, if you give a little shake like that, it knocks a lot of that water out. I don't care, but you're going to be standing in wet feet. These fish are taking real well. It's a big one, isn't it? better than what we can. Many lakes will freeze over in winter. There is a danger of winter kill if the lake is not deep enough to provide the necessary oxygen. The fish then usually feed on freshwater shrimp and other deep water insects. Rainbows can even be caught in winter by drilling holes in the ice. Yeah, you hit that one just right bang on. I don't know whether you got a good set on that hook, but I took know. five. I lost you it? No, you're up to him. You caught up to him. You hit him on just right. Once that hook is set, you're okay. You got no problem. Just oh. Yeah, don't let him. They say don't let him fight you too close to the boat. See how? You keep this right up in the air like this, Ruth. And any time he goes down, you can just sort of go down with him. Okay, yeah, but I broke that line that time. Yeah. Well, if you point the rod at the fish, you lose him every time. Just if you point the rod right at him, and he's long gone. They get a straight pull right at you. So, you know, just keep it well up, and just use your wrist, and you got no problem. Don't go in after him. 
<laughs> Don't? Why? Uh, he'll, oh! He'll come to you eventually, I think. There you are. Shake it. Oh, I'm glad you let me uh, <laughs> catch the odd one once in a while, too, you know. Sure going good, aren't they? Sure. Got that right on the top of his nose. That means we're masked real right for the fly. Unlike saltwater fishing, a license is required to fish freshwater lakes and streams in British Columbia. The cost, only $2. Just for the thrill of the outdoors on one of the many such beautiful lakes and the chance of hooking the rainbow, so aptly named for beauty in color, is well worth the cost, time, and effort. In the heat of the summer, it is best to head for one of the higher altitude lakes. When the waters warm up, the fish take to the cooler areas at the bottom of the lake. When the fish take to the depth, a wet fly will often produce the daily generous limit of 12 fish. It appears our party had great success in their quest for the mighty fighting rainbow and will have the usual tales of the big one that got away and many fine pan fries of excellent eating trout. Mule deer, that's what we're going to be after in this trip, and we're going to go up into the Lillooet country, approximately 200 miles north of Vancouver in British Columbia, back in Canada once again. Uh, I'd like to call in our good guy, and Joel Bingham is going to take us in on this trip, Joe. It looks like we're going through some beautiful country. Yes, you'll uh, get some of the nicest rainbow fishing you'll find in British Columbia back in the Bridge River country. It looks like very beautiful country indeed. Uh, there are many lakes I am to imagine in this country, is there? Yes, there's uh, a good many. Uh, some of them are really not too accessible. Looks uh, like we're getting into the backwoods country. Cowboys and all cattle country here, Joe? Yeah, we're getting into the cattle country, uh, the Bridge River. The Tyax, Tyax Lodge, where we are now. This is uh, your base of operations, is that correct, Joe? Yes, uh, this is it. It's, uh, we call it Tyax Lake. Uh, it's registered on the maps as Tyotin Lake. Uh, shoeing your horses, Joe? You yes, uh, I do my own uh, shoeing, Bill, and uh, we have to hard surface all the horseshoes because of the volcanic ash in the country at, uh, and the rocks. They chew the shoes up very quickly. How many horses have you got, Joe? Looks to be quite a number there. Uh, we're using about 15 head on uh, this particular trip. How many have you got all together? Uh, we'll have uh, about 20 head this year. Gosh, this packing horses, that's quite a little trick. It's almost becoming a lost art. Uh, it's an art of its own. I quite I enjoy it very much. We have a, a lot of fun uh, getting those packs on and I see what you mean, it's a bit of an art, all right. This fellow seems to not take him too kindly to it. Well, this chap here, he's a, a very good pack horse, but every once in a while he takes a notion that he's going to act up a little bit. I guess it's been a few days since he was packed, and uh, he'll be snorting around, and all of a sudden he'll stand as still as a mouse. And... Must be quite a, quite a knack to tying those boxes on so they don't slip off. Uh... I imagine some of the country we'll be traveling will be pretty rough with it, not? Yes, uh, we put these basket ropes on to tie them on tight, and then uh, you put your rolls and everything on top, and then tie a diamond, which is uh, the word that's used in tying these on properly in the end. Our young lady you see, a very charming young lady getting on board the horse, is Diane Carruthers, a housewife from West Vancouver, ironically an otter's never even fired a rifle before, and Joe's going to take her in, show her how to fire a rifle, and try and get her a mule deer. So we're on the trail now, Joe, from your base camp. Uh, where are we heading? Uh, we're heading up Gun Creek right now. Um, it's plenty rocky and uh, a beautiful trail, really. I can see why you have your horses shooed. Uh, they certainly seem very sure-footed. Yeah, they have to be. Uh, we can't take any blood strings in there. We have to have uh, fairly sound horses unless we have good riders and uh, we keep very good sound strong horses. Gosh, beautiful looking country. Yeah, uh, that's our cook there riding along, Madden McLeod. Uh, do the horses ever get hung up in the trees, try to go between two trees a little too narrow, Joe? Yes, uh, a lot of times they do. Uh, but some of them, after a while they 
to get hooked onto the trees and they smarten up. They, uh, they managed to wiggle through or back around it. Yeah, they sure do. Yes, that's certainly beautiful. Now, this, this is the Spruce Lake, is it? This is Spruce Lake. There you can see the fish jumping. It's one of the nicest fishing spots, and you can't be called a fisherman if you can't take your... Limit out of this lake. Limit yeah. out of this lake, yeah. Well, how high is that lake, Joe? Uh, that lake's uh, a little better than the 5,000-foot level. Mm-hmm. Well, we're on the road again. I'll just... Uh how far did we travel into Spruce Lake to our base camp? Now, how far is that from Tyax? Uh, going up Gun Creek, uh, we have a couple of ways going in, but going up Gun Creek, it's approximately 18 miles. And what's this creek now, Joe? This is uh, well up on the Tyax Creek right now. Well, how far in are we going uh, from Spruce Lake now? Oh, it'll be another 12, 15 miles up to the headwaters of the Tyax Creek. What's that creature? That's a wolverine. That's a very rare specimen, you might say. Uh, a real cagey little animal. You don't see too many of them. And uh, pound for pound, the strongest animal in the world. Good gosh. I've good. seen them kill a 200-pound deer. Amazing. Must be amazing strength. Yeah, they sure are. What beautiful country. How high would we be now, Joe? Oh, we're well over the 7,000-foot level here up in the Lizard Range. And this is where we're going to find these mule deer. Well, we'll find lots of them up here. Well, there's other species. There's the Columbia blacktail or coast deer, I understand, and the whitetail. Do we find any of them in this area? No, no you won't find them uh, up in here. Just the mules we have in this here no. particular area. And the, you can see how steep it is by the deer there with their mouth open when they're climbing over the mountains. Yeah, no moose in this area? No, well, not right on this spot. We have moose in the area. Uh, yes, we have lots of moose, but not right here. Mm. Well, it looks like you spotted something. This is where you got to be very, very quiet, I guess. Yeah, you sure do. Uh, be sure you don't chip any wood. Well, Joe, we have the mule deer in this part of the country. Where do we, where do we find, for example, the whitetail? None of them in this area at all? Well, whitetail in British Columbia are generally found in the eastern side of the province. What about these... Uh, Blacktails or coast deer, where do we find them? Are they, they don't range inland at all? No, they don't. They uh, stay pretty well down on the coast and on the island. Well, I understand a big mule deer, about six foot long and about four foot high. It's only way up as high as 350 pounds. Yes, uh, the biggest one we've got in this country has been about 300 pounds. with the rifle for her to go out and get one right off the bat like that. Yeah, well, I wanted to get her pretty close to the first one and uh, give her confidence in her shooting. Uh, it's quite a little trade. How did she get along in her rifle firing uh, instruction? Was she a little nervous to start? Yes, uh, she was quite nervous. She didn't like the kick of the gun. Well, done very well. How old would that one be, Joe, would you say? This one's a, a three-year-old. Uh, Got a double fork with the little prongs coming in. Now what's what's the reason for this, Joe? Well, in the uh, mating season, we have uh, the uh, this is the scent gland on the inside of the back leg, which should be cut off because it sometimes taints the meat uh, after the animal is shot. So we generally try and remove that. The animals here appear to be in excellent shape. Oh, they're beautiful up there. Uh, some of the best eating deer I've ever had in the whole of British Columbia come out of the Bridge River area. We have the minerals uh, in the ground, which makes the difference. Sure, with all these horses, you just keep them for the hunting season only? No, uh, we don't, Bill. Uh, I specialize in trail rides in the summertime. I have five cabins spread out in the mountains, and we can go back in there 
photography, fishing, uh, hunting uh, these uh, fossils, a lot of fossils in the country, beautiful for photography. And uh, oh, there's lots of marmots, there's animals of all sorts back in there. Now there's a big buck in here somewhere. I know there is, but where he is, I don't know. Yeah, I think I can see him right behind me. Little buck, can you see him? No, no, that's the doe. That's the doe. Shh. Oh, I think he hears us. He sees him. I think he hears us. Oh, there he's running. He's running. All right, take it close, baby. Congratulations, Diane. Nice going, kiddo. Thanks, Robin. Really I'm good. Wasn't it, Joe? I had well, space with myself, actually. Two more. How oh, and I hell you ever hit them? I'll never know. Gee. Well, you don't was... forget I had you giving me all the expert advice. How could I miss? I don't know. That big buck running like that, I don't know how you hit him right in the <laughs> neck. Holy mackerel. Well, that was pretty good. And you would do it, too. No pack horses today. So oh. you're going to have to walk home, kiddo. I've forgotten all about it. Yeah. Didn't you know? Yeah. Well, is the limit three deer, Joe? Yes, the limit's uh, three deer, Bill, uh, in this area. Uh, which, too, must be of the male species in a certain time of the season. This time of the season, it's strictly bucks. Well, if that's the indication of the success of a trip in that area, uh, deer must be plentiful. Yes, uh, they are. They're quite plentiful at the right time of year. You get the right spots and uh, pretty hard to miss. A beautiful country to hunt you, too. Some of the most beautiful country I've seen anywhere. Yeah. And now for the long trek back to camp, uh, how far do you have to walk, Joe, in this case? Well, we had to walk um, about three miles that particular day, but it was all downhill. Well, it's back to base camp after a very, very successful hunt indeed and plenty of meat for the table. Yeah. Yes, just fishing, and this time we travel further to the north of British Columbia, Canada, to the Fort St. James area, approximately 600 miles north of Vancouver, B.C. We are after the large lake trout of the Char family that inhabits the subarctic Arctic waters, preferring the cool depths of the northern lakes. The big lake lunkers, as often called, are found in many lakes from the Great Lakes in the eastern portion of Canada and through the northern lakes on the Prairie Provinces, British Columbia, and the territories. They're found in large numbers as far north as the polar ice caps. The pretty young lady with the party is Pat Watson, a stenographer who has never seen a fish caught before. The instructor is George Davis, a resident and well-known guide of the Fort St. James area. Let's listen in on the instruction. Well, we will pull this one first now. Just push that. Then you make your cast, you see, with your thumb. And then just start to, to reel, and then it comes out, you see. And that's it, is it? That's it. But when I say the release, you, you uh, make sure you know which I mean, and that's that there. And the next lesson we'll do right in the boat. It appears to be light tackle to attempt to catch a possible 40-pound trout, short flexible rod, small light reels. The size of the lures they will use on the eight-pound test line, this is a real sporting method. The fish they are after are meat feeders living primarily on kokanee, better known as landlocked salmon. During the time of evolution, many lakes were choked off from the sea, trapping many fishes. Although very small, a large one would weigh four pounds, they continued to spawn in creeks along the shores of the lakes in large numbers. And if the fish starts to run, you just have to back up half a turn like this and it releases the line to run. Can you remember that? If he starts to pull too hard, just pull back. That and that'll let the line go and then it doesn't matter what tension set on here, it'll still release the line out, you see? Okay? I'll try. And now I'll show you a few of the lures. This is a, quite a spoon, isn't it? Well, you, uh, with the light line, you more or less sling this out. 
then we drift with the wind, let this sink to the bottom, and retrieve it in a up and down motion. What should we catch with this? Oh, this will be those big lakers that you're after. That's quite a size of spoon, isn't it? But that's the only thing they want. If you're going to have big fish, you've got to use big lures. Bill Lopeshuk, a well-known bush pilot of long standing in the North Country, who leave the base camp from Fort St. James to travel to a remote lake known as Cunningham, 45 miles to the west. The lake trout averages from 5 to 12 pounds some up to 25 pounds, but today, the latter weight is generally considered unusual. The country is dotted with many such lakes, most of which contain a number of species of trout. There are four well-known trout species of the char family. Our lake trout, of course, Eastern Brook trout, Dolly Varden, and Arctic char. They are all lake fall spawners and frequent the cooler waters. Many have been transplanted in various regions, adapting readily to the change. The lake our party has chosen often use lake trout, known as the giant of the trout family, that weights up to 40 pounds. 25 pounders are not uncommon in this area. The feed is plentiful, water temperatures ideal, depths ranging from shallow to very deep. Few people fish the area because of accessibility. To arrive by boat, there is an 18-mile portage. To travel by plane, one has to bring along their own boat. There are no roads to within 30 miles. The terrain is very difficult for one to travel on foot. Rainbow trout fishing is also good in this area. They, too, often provide food for the char. This is, uh, this is the spot. How far would you think we'd be from Prince George now? This particular cabin is a base camp that George Davis uses in the fall for his hunters. He doesn't take too many fishing parties in. However, uh, in this particular case, uh, he was most interested in taking Pat in and proving to her that she, although had never fished before, could catch one of these lake lunkers, as we call them. Uh, yes, this is rain and a little bit of leakage. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, I can make it okay. They have certainly picked excellent weather for the fishing trip. Notice the lengths of the boat they are to use. They are of a type used mainly on swift running rivers of the North Country for transportation, traveling through very swift rapids. George Davis chose such craft for stability on the lake because of sudden windstorms that occasionally spring up unexpected. The units are an excellent sea boat capable of transporting very heavy loads. Boats are used for the excellent moose hunting in this area in the fall of the year. There are few boats on this lake. A few are owned by the native Indians who use them during the summer to net the lake trout for their winter food. The natives also carry out trapping in this area. The first object lesson is to locate the fish. They travel in schools and migrate about the lake from time to time. They can be in one bay today and moved on the next. In the Great Slave and Great Lakes, over 10 million pounds are harvested annually by commercial fishermen. The laker is the only member of the trout family that are fished commercially in Canada. In summer, they are to be found in very deep waters recorded up to 200 feet. To attract these large lake trout, you have to give the large metal lure action that will simulate the movement of a smaller fish. Just as soon as Mr. Laker hits the lure, the hooks must be firmly set. The lure is usually activated in a jigging motion. The wind often helps lure action as a result of the drift. Fish will strike readily at the shiny spoon. This is a very light line. This is only a eight pound test line on here, but this reel, the way I showed you to use it before, it will handle the fish very nicely. And uh, the main thing with these fish is just to keep them coming. The first time, when after the, uh, the initial strike, you set the hook real hard. I'll show you how to do that. And uh, then they'll swim down. They always sound. So 
you'll feel like there isn't too much weight until they get down below the boat and then you'll have to start pulling them up. And sometimes they come quite easy till they see the boat and then, but you'll see what fun it is on night tackle. Our green Nimrod, Pat, is getting plenty of instruction from George under the watchful eye of Pilot Bill. One thing to remember, that extremely light eight pound test line. The lake trout, as a food fish, is very rich in oil, delicious barbecued or smoked. As a game fish, they fight well, all this being done underwater. They do not leap clear of the surface, but tend to sound for reasons of being a bottom feeder. They are carnivorous and have a large, sharp teeth. Once they lock their jaws around a kokanee, the fight for life of the smaller fish is over. An average sized lake trout will consume three to four one and one half pound kokanee at a feeding. Pat Watkins works as a stenographer for the American consulate in Vancouver, being somewhat out of her element fishing in these parts for the large trout. You have probably noticed that George has an injured hand, but this is no handicap at all for him. He will handle a rod or rifle like the veteran he is. You should see him field dress a moose with that hand. The reef runs between these two islands, Bill, and the, uh, the fish are passing through here all the time. And we, uh, this is the shallowest point that we can get at them. So if we spin here, they're passing back. They've got to come up to go over so we get them at the shallowest point. Well, they're into their first fish. A little more instruction with the fish on before Pat has headed the rod. With such a bend on the fishing stick, this could be a fair-sized fish. It'll be interesting to see how Pat reacts when given the rod. Remember, she has never seen one caught, let alone physically take part. Pull him up a little like this. Drop the rod a little. Pump him up a little. Final instructions. A large fish on this lake line could be very tricky. As we mentioned earlier, 25 pounders are not uncommon in this lake. When the fish decides to sound, you must be ready to give him line. Now that Pat has a fishing rod in her hand for the very first time, this could be interesting if Mr. Lake Lunker decides to make a run for it. From observation, it appears we have a very cautious fisherman in Pat. That's it, drop the rod, tip down. Now, just bring the pressure, gradually lift him up. That's it, not too hard, up a little higher. Oh, well, yeah. let him let pull, him the, pull the rod back, that's it. And he'll, he'll oh. take it out. All right, now, immediately tighten up on him when he stops, that's it. Thank Bring it back. She doesn't snap that rod, it really had a bend in it there. Give me the... Uh, <laughs> Now just hold him up a little so he can, he'll, he'll get some... Wind him in? Yeah, wind him in a little. How is that for a Now bring him over to me and I'll, I'll knit him. Looks like a fair size one. Let's watch Pat's reaction to this. Hey, Cord! <laughs> <laughs> I bet you right now Pat is wishing well. she was back home washing dishes in her apartment. Look at the way she seems to be scared stiff. So watch he doesn't twist on your hand, Bill. I'll, I'll sock him first. Brain him. Hit him again. Now, there we are. What do you think of that one? Isn't he gorgeous? Now, you just take a hold of him like that. <laughs> Oh. You got a hold of him? Oh, yes. Huh? Oh, yes. All right, he's going to drop. You haven't got him. <laughs> oh, he's heavy. Oh, he's... Is that a dandy? Yes, he is. Well... Oh, you can have him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just give me a little slack line there. Uh, that's it. We well, got your lunch, Bill. Oh, that is, you see how it's done? Now you got to get one yourself, Pat. Okay, George, I'll try my best. Okay, <laughs> we'll just put this fella down here. Oh, at least we've got lunch people. 
Yeah, we got the we got lunch. <laughs> yes, sir. Now let's see. Okay. Well, let's see. Her. Fly at her again. Let's reel the line up to the top and press the thumb on. That's it. Press the thumb. Press the thumb and keep it there. And just back over your shoulder. That's it. Let her go and let the thumb go at the same time. That's the idea. Not very far out. Oh, that's pretty good. Let's play in line out here. That's it. Keep playing it out until it slacks off. Pat did not know whether to ride this one out or jump overboard. After that one, she's now a well-seasoned veteran fisherman. Wait till the girls hear about this big one that did not get away. There's enough here to give all the girls in the office trout steaks. Give another jig like that. Now, if you feel something latch onto it, as you're jigging like this, then the moment he latches on and starts to pull a little bit, you just bring the rod tightly up like that to set the hook into him, you see? Savvy? Yeah. Okay, you have a go at it. These fish have a very practical location to do their spawning in late fall, usually October. They select shallow waters of a bay in the same spot where the kokanee are also spawning. The lakers spawn and feed at the same time unlike our salmon of the sea. After spawning, they return to their haunts and continue to eat and grow. The largest one taken from this lake was 47 pounds. The second fish, but this one is not so large, did not put up much of a scrap. It was badly fouled up in the line. George is quite sure of this one, not even going to use the net. He wound himself up in the line, you see. Got another one. Yeah, you see what a mess he made there? He just tangled himself up and then tied his gills up. That's why he didn't fight too much, you see. It looks like they surely have found the right spot. They could have a real large one on by the way Pat is braced against the boat. There's a fair wind blowing now that will help assist the action of the lure. Here is the true value of such a boat in stability while fighting a fish in this manner. No rocking, rolling, nor pitching to throw one off balance. It appears they're both rooting for Pat this time. Easy now. Let him run if he wants to. Don't let him have any slack or he can decide to run and snap the line. That's the way. Ease him up now. Don't rush it. We've got all day. Hold it to Dandy. Not too fast now. Just take it easy. Reel down. Down a little further. Now, lever him up. Up. That's not too hard. Just a steady pressure. That's it. Now, down the same way. They're gaining. They're gaining. Yeah, he's I coming. hope so. Uh, leave them down now and pick up the line going down. You don't need to reel coming up, Pat. Just keep your uh, reel steady. Now lift your lift rod them. up. That's it. Don't okay. Slack now. This does appear to be a large one. One slip now, and he is long gone. Tension is really mounting now. Pat is getting advice thick and fast. This time, Pat has been completely unassisted, having hooked the fish entirely on her own. If this one is bolted, Pat will no doubt have her own set of rules on how to catch the big ones. Lift him up in the air a little bit more. Lift your rod. Still up. reeling? Yep. yep. Ah! Oh! You got him. He's lovely. There's a dandy. Okay, I'll take the rod. God, if we had another boat alongside there, I'm afraid Pat would have jumped right into the other boat when that fish came in. That bent the old net a little bit. How, how much would he weigh, George? Oh, he's a good 20, 22 pounds, this fella. 
That was a good size one, typical of the average in this lake. There will be some great fish stories traveling through the office when Pat returns. This has been a very productive first fishing trip for the young lady from the front office. George also seemed to enjoy his work. The largest fish taken for the day, 27 pounds. I'd be willing to lay odds that Pat will be booking another trip into this paradise lake that is situated 600 miles away from her office and phones at an elevation of 2,400 feet above sea level. There are many more fish still in the lake, but next time we hope you catch one of the larger ones. So it's back to civilization, tired but happy, with many five feeds of the giants of the lake trout family, the Lake Char. <laughs>